Rita Springer with us this weekend. All right, so I'm going to be totally honest with you this morning. So, Rita, brace yourself for this. So, personally, I have, for, for a couple of decades, just have personally been so blessed by Rita's worship, her songwriting, her anointing. And to be totally honest, in some of the most challenging seasons of my life, it has been her music that I've kind of listened to throughout that. So when we were thinking about who we wanted to bring in for this weekend, it was, it, I was so excited at the thought of Rita Springer. But to be honest, I was excited about her coming and leading us in worship. And oh my goodness, did she bring the anointing with her this weekend. But here's the, here's the part where I said I'm going to be honest. So I figured she's going to be amazing at leading worship. And like, her word's going to be pretty good, you know. The, the women will receive from it. It's not like it's going to be bad. Oh my goodness, I was knocked on my butt like 15 times. I mean, she brought God's heart to our ladies. She brings wisdom, experience, fire. So boy, was I beyond pleasantly surprised at the word that she brought. So I just want you to know you are in for a treat this morning. Open your hearts because God has something to say to us individually, but I believe as a church through this word this morning. So can you please stand and welcome Rita Springer. Oh, she's such a liar. <laughs> You guys can sit down, sit down. Um, is Bryce still in here? Um, I was sitting over there and the Holy Spirit started talking to me about you, Bryce. Um, and so um, I just, uh, you know, I've watched you all weekend. You guys are such servants. They're really servants, these, the band. And there's so much servanthood in this church. It's really beautiful to see, um, especially when a church has a high volunteer rate. Um, I think that's just a kingdom thing. But I was just watching you this weekend, and the, and the Lord just started speaking to me about you. And, you know, you don't meet, how old are you? What are you? 20. 20. Yeah, like, whatever. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, you're, you're in the beginning stages of really trying to figure out who you are. And I just, you know, I, I was even telling Lauren on the way here that um, the Lord... Uh, it, when I talk to my students, I give them kind of the, uh, the, the God of decades. And so um, the way I've watched it work is 20 to 30, you're kind of figuring out who you are. Prior to 20, you're brain dead. <laughs> and so, um, but 20 to 30, you're kind of working yourself out and figuring out who you are. 30 to 40, you're, you should be walking in it. And 40 on up, you know, you're still learning those things, but you're, you're mentoring, you're giving it away. And if we consecutively do that in our lives, we're rich. We, we have these rich, fulfilled lives. It's when we don't know what we're doing in that decade of 20 to 30, we never figure out who we are, and we drag that into our 30s. And then we never fully walk out what we're called to, and we drag that into our 40s. And that's um, sometimes where we just become people in no man's land and I felt like the Lord said that you were, are um, on this brilliant journey of beginning to figure out who you are, but that you've started um, with some wisdom even at 20. There's a beautiful humility on you, kid. There's a beautiful humility on you. Just how you speak to people and how you talk to people is really quite amazing. Is your, is your parents in here? <clears throat> where, where is your mother? Because I was sitting there and I felt like if, there, if his parents are in here, because the Lord was like, it's because of the, the foundations of what you guys have poured into that kid. And I, I, I just felt prophetically that the Lord wants to tell you, you will see in him everything you've asked the Lord for. You will see in this young man, because 
Bryce, I just saw the Lord, like all these roads, like all these musical, creative roads leading. Even when you, when you were, you grabbed your pink backpack back there and you were just, you know, the, that was the first thing I was like, this kid has creativity all over him. And this is a God movement in your life because God is doing something with the creative. And it isn't just the guitar. I think actually you have other instruments that you play and other things that you do. But I just saw the Lord splitting off all these different musical creative roads for you. And that the Lord says that, that whatever road you choose to do, there will be no ceilings for you. That you can go outside the box, you can do what you wanna do because the foundations that they have laid for you will always be the thing that, that measures and balances you out. Um, uh, I wouldn't even um, uh, doubt that your mothers pray that you don't turn to the right nor to the left without the presence of God, um, uh, uh, making sure that your navigation system is right. And so you're on a short leash, right mom? <laughs> And that means that whenever you start to teeter away, the Lord's going to yank you back because you were made for greatness and you were made for great things. And I think you need to hear that now because we're seeing the younger generation, the younger and younger that they are, that the Holy Spirit is starting to move on them really, really early on. And God's breathed on you probably even in the womb. And there are, I wouldn't even, I would venture to guess that they've been prophesied and your mother felt things while you were in the womb about you, but that you're gonna honor not only your house, but honor the, the kingdom of God. And to remember that you need to dream outside the box. Do not let religion keep you in a box but let relationship with God actually begin to just spur you on to, to believe in things. And I think there's movement and in music and lyrics and all kinds of stuff, but there's a servant's heart on you. And I just wanted to encourage you in that, that this generation's gonna see that just generation flourish because of the responsibility and the, um, and the commitment um, to intercession and to prayer. And I just wanna honor you as parents for, for raising that. It's amazing. Like I'd love to do that. I think it's okay to threaten our children. <laughs> I tell my kid all the time, even when he tries to like say like stupid untruths, you know, kids like my kid's almost 14. And you know, it's just like stupid little things that he just doesn't tell you. And I don't know why, because schools have this system where if there's anything that comes up or a test that they didn't, you know, or a homework that they didn't turn in, it's like all right there for us to read in the email. And so, and then when they deny it, it's like, what's well, right here in print, what you didn't do. So it's kind of funny because I always tell my son, you know, I don't know what God feels about you, but I know he loves me. So he's going to tell me when you're not doing something you shouldn't be doing. And I'm asking him to tell me what you're doing. So you're hosed anyway, because I have a God that loves me and that actually loves you so much that he's going to dime you out really quick because he has a plan for your life. So... So I threaten my kid all the time with the Lord. It's, it's really awesome. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Jonah chapter one. I felt like the Lord, I know, I know it's a heavy book. Um, but I felt like um, this is such a, a beautiful message for um, even leadership in the church. Um, and I have been in ministry now for over 20 something years and have seen so many Jonas get on boats and head to Tarshish. And um, I think it's a word over us because I think the enemy has got a plot over a lot of our lives to, to sway us into believing that God isn't who he says he is. And, um, and this is really a fascinating book in the Bible. It's a very short book, um, but it's, a very, it's packed with a lot of um, powerful points. So I'm just going to read. Um, you can listen. You can read along if you want. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Jaffa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. 
All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep and the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they ask him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country and from what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they ask, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher and so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm for us? Pick me up. And throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that this is my fault and that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land that they could not, for the sea had even grown, grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they'd offered a great sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. This, this even, this is so awesome. Like this is so full of information on how not to do something that you shouldn't ever do or how not to be found in a place where you shouldn't ever be found. We're talking about a prophet, a minor prophet, but a prophet. And, and this kind of cracks me up because I have a prophetic gift, but the Lord has never laid on me to go into a city of hundreds of thousands of people and declare to them that God was gonna take them all out. In fact, later on in scripture, you find out that the word that Jonah had to give took three days to actually go up and down through the city and declare what God was actually having him declare. So even in my prophetic gift, I've never been asked to do something so amazing. So minor prophet or not, I want to make the real realization that Jonah was a man that God had put his anointing on and gave him a proclamation, gave him words that were deeper than probably probably most of us in here have ever heard from the Lord. And so it means that Jonah had a um, track record with God that he must have known the voice of God in order to hear some of the most heaviest of things and to follow out what God is actually saying. He is um, an honored man, obviously, if the anointing of God is on him, but somehow he's gotten himself into a place where he no longer is in alignment with the voice of God and something somehow has got him so disappointed and so at unrest with God's own voice that he gets to Joppa and he buys a ticket to Tarshish. And so the road to Joppa from here to Jaffa and then getting the ticket to get on a boat and go clear in the opposite direction of where God's called you. My question is, what's happened from here to here in a man's life that's walking with the Lord and he decides to walk away full blown, even to the point that he discusses what he's doing on the boat before the storm even occurs, according to scripture. He'd already told them he was doing this. So he's gotten sloppy even in his sarcasm that he doesn't really care who hears it anymore that he's in delay and dismay with God. How do we get to a place in our life where we start walking to Jaffa? And a lot of us in the church do it. In fact, it is a prevalent day right now that we're questioning the word, we're questioning the validity of God, we're questioning um, how God works, how he heals, what kind of miracles he does, and if he's even relevant for a millennial generation. We're questioning all of it. And so the interesting thing to me is it's really not that hard to start walking to Joppa. 
And, and that's where the danger lies. Somehow this prophetic man, somehow this prophet, this man of God has gotten to the point where he is sick and tired of the voice of God. That's a dangerous, dangerous place to get. And it's prevalent all over the church. And it isn't, I don't think, just about the fact that um, God doesn't do it our way. I think for some that is. But it's, I think it's years and years and years and years of stored up and pent up and stored up and pent up things that we don't lay down before the Lord, that we don't give away before the Lord because we'd rather keep our sin than be exposed to holiness because the, 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 the reality of it is when you, when you let your sin down, all of a sudden you're exposed to a holy lifestyle that you haven't yet lived. So you're exposed to holiness, but the enemy will say, if you, if you lay your sin down, you'll be exposed and everybody will know what you do. But you know, there's a church in Queens that I went, uh, I went to years ago. Now I'm very good friends with the pastors and I was blown away when I got in there. First, because it's the only place I've had a 185-piece Puerto Rican choir. And it was just unbelievable. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But when the pastors, um, when the pastors of the church were introducing me to people, just in the congregation, like just walking around the sanctuary, she would pull over somebody and she would say, Tony, Tony, come. Tell her what God did for your life when you were a transvestite. Maria, Maria, come over here. Tell Rita when you were a prostitute and what the Lord did for you. And I'd never had anybody introduce themselves to me like that, ever, <laughs> in the church. In my lily white church growing up in Southern California, nobody said, hey, my name is Jane. I used to be a prostitute till the Lord saved me. Nobody talked about their sin, their past sins. And I thought, what revelation that you're actually saying, yeah, I used to be this, but look what the Lord's done. It was full-blown testimony, like there was no guilt, there was no shame. It was out there in the open so that nothing could be held against them for the rest of their life. And sometimes we get into the place, into the, into the positioning where, because we don't lay things down, we don't lay down our offenses, we don't lay down um, our anger, we don't lay down our rage, we hold on. Yesterday we talked about hoarding. You know, I watch um, that show Hoarders sometimes. It was actually on this morning when I flipped on the news. And to me, it's a, it's, it's a brilliant symbolism to what happens to us inside when tragedy or something, some kind of circumstance shifts the ground you're walking on and you don't fully lay it down and so years accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. There's not one episode of that show that you don't find out the trauma that occurred that was the reason for the hoard. And so we're doing this in the spirit and here is this, this, this beautiful prophetic man whose gift is this and God, God is bleeding for a city, for an entire city. And he has this man say, I'm done with the sin of the city. Go to the city and do this. And he gets on a boat with a bunch of unsaved people. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, he gets on the boat, not even caring who he's on the boat with. And because he's, he is so blasé anymore with his belief system, he so doesn't care anymore, he just falls fast asleep and the storm rages around him. And an unsaved captain has to come down to the ship and say, how in the world have you gotten to the point in your life when you can sleep through this kind of storm? I mean, literally, it's kind of what's being laid out before us. How can you get to the place where you no longer hear the reasoning? You no longer find the balance. You no longer want the integrity. You no longer want the release or want the submission that you just are like, forget it. I'm not going to do this anymore. And I don't care what happens to anybody else around me. All I want to do is do what I want to do. And here are these, these unsaved people who are calling out to these um, foreign gods and this captain of the ship who is not saved at all, but they're wise enough to know. I mean, this is what blows me away. You, this is the mercy of God. Jonah puts all of these people in peril that, are sh that should be the people that he actually witnesses to. 
And so God has to go around Jonah and use Jonah himself, even when he's thrown overboard. What I love about this story is he's thrown overboard and these people are actually calling out to his God saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, please don't hold us accountable for what we're doing to this guy. They're so afraid that if this guy's God is that powerful, that he's after a man trying to turn a man around and turn a man around and turn a man around and the man's not listening, they're actually afraid to throw him overboard. And it's, it's, it's just fascinating to me how, how God's mercy is even seen in the midst of that, that God would turn around. I mean, I love at the end in verse 16, it says, at this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Like they all get saved. They throw the, the bomb overboard and they all get saved because of what they've just seen. The mercy of God is that he's not gonna allow you to destroy other people's lives all the time. You know, <clears throat> I heard this um, missionary talk once and it changed my life. It changed my life, what he said. He said that, you know, he'd been accustomed to giving everything away. He, the, he and his wife lived as missionaries. They gave everything away. And so they knew what the Lord was saying. When the, Lord vo the Lord's voice said, go to that country, they had to be like built up in prayer in order, order to hear those costly things that the Lord was telling them to do with their family. And so they hear the Lord say, take your only vehicle and give it away to this particular couple. They don't have another vehicle. They don't have means to actually even purchase another vehicle. But the same voice that told them to go on the mission field and the same voice that said that he would provide that they'd seen hundreds of times provided was the same voice that said, humble yourself and just give this couple this van and trust in me. And so they just did it. And months went by and they had no car. And now it was beginning to cost them what they didn't have. And all of a sudden they began to start questioning whether or not they ever even heard the Lord. And he said, one day, um, I don't know how many months later, somebody came and said, um, the Lord has told us to buy you a, a car. And while there was great relief, he said he went back to the Lord and he just said, you're gonna have to walk me through this. I'm grateful for this. But we've now been in a season where all this question has started to occur. And I just need to ask you, did I do something wrong? Like, was there something in me that wasn't right? And the Holy Spirit said to him, son, I've asked 10 people to give you a car. That's the first couple that even obeyed me. Jesus. And so when he said that, I just was like, oh my gosh, how many times have I cost somebody the question because I was too afraid to actually respond the way the Lord was asking me to respond. How much delay was in me or, or, or how much just fear Fear was in me to, to not pay for the person's groceries or not reach out and say something to somebody or not give somebody the word or not do what I was asked to do that God had to go around about and around about and around about and around about because his point was to get them encouraged. His point was to get them to see that he, he had seen them, that he was watching them, that he was providing for them. And how many times have I stopped that process because I wasn't willing to hear God? Why is it important to God to have to go through 10 people? Can God turn a man's heart automatically? Yeah, but there's something about obedience that was always the key. In, in, in Genesis chapter one, the, the obedience of Genesis is, there's a tree here, don't eat of it or you may die. And it was all about obedience. The center of the garden was obedience. James says, you come to me, I'll come to you. He's not a forcible God. He's not a God that's gonna whiplash you because you don't obey him. He's a God that patiently waits. But when you're in the stream of God and you're committed to the Lord and you say things with your mouth, but you do not begin to do them with your heart, all of a sudden God has to track you down. And we, we've got a man here that has led this life of, of a prophetic utterance that is now running so far away from God that it's almost that he's costing other people their life. And God has to step in. And what God ends up doing is he redeems a whole boat. They throw him overboard. I want you to listen to his prayer. He's in the belly of a whale, which I don't even know how that happens. But he's in the belly of a whale, so listen to his prayer. In my distress, he says, I called to the Lord, 
And he answered me, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and he listened to my cry. He hurled me into the depths and to the very heart of the seas and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up out of the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish to vomit Jonah to the land. Okay, let's just talk about the prayer. If you'll, you'll notice that every line of the prayer has to do with the peril in which he finds himself. He's not saying, I have been angry with you. I have started this trek where I started um, not doing what I should be doing and I got my offenses in there and it's been years now that I've been really offended with you and I am angry with you with this and this and this. You told me I was going to get to do that and I never got to do that. You said this and this and you know my marriage failed and blah, 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 or whatever it is. You don't hear any of the past which, which was the length of time that it took him to get from where he was at with God to make the decision to walk to Jaffa. All he talks about is, I was thrown into the bottom of the sea and this fish swallowed me and seaweed wrapped around my head and I was dying down there. Like it was really bad down there. And so God, I cry out to you and I say, okay, 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 okay. I'll do what you asked me to do. He's vomited up on the shore. I think that's really important for you to hear. It's, it's, it's the momentary prayers that God will even hear and say, okay, now what are you going to do? But when we find out what Jonah's later on decision is, we know that he hasn't ever dealt with any one thing that's caused his problem. Because he's just had a really traumatic fish experience. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I would call out to the Lord for help too. If I was actually still alive in the belly of a whale and had to deal with that, because a lot of times you would just succumb to be like, I'm just gonna drown myself, this is way too traumatic for me. But this guy's having this thing, and he has a momentary lapse, and he calls out to the Lord, and the Lord's like, okay, okay, let's see what you do. He vomits a bump onto land, and then in, in chapter three it says, when the Lord, word of the Lord came to Jonah for the second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it to the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, went to Nineveh, and Nineveh was a very large city. Here's where it says, it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God and a fast was proclaimed. Listen to this. The guy goes through the city for three days. And it's not like it says in scripture that people are like, you're a fool. You're full of it. He's not, he, it doesn't say that he's like um, made fun of or arrested or anything. The people are like, what? Everybody stop eating. I mean, it, there was a quick turn. It was a massive quick turn. For a city that the Lord was saying, I'm done with it. That's a pretty quick repentance. This story isn't about that. This story is about this guy's heart. This whole journey was about this man's heart. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it blows my mind. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king, he doesn't rise from his throne in anger. He doesn't send his guards out to thrash this man, which would be what we would think with the city under that much sin. He rose from his throne and took off his royal robes and covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation he issues over his city. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, let but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn his fierce anger so that we may not perish. 
and God does just that. Here is this king who has probably, you would assume based on the word of the Lord, he's an arrogant guy, and he shows none of that arrogance. In fact, he says, nobody eat None of your dogs, none of your cats, none of your parakeets, none of your lizards, none of your cows, none of your goats. Don't even feed your animals, but cover your animals with sackcloth so that there's not one living, breathing thing in this city that's not urgently calling on the Lord. That's amazing. It's not about this city. It's about this man. And then God relents and it ticks this prophet off. I mean, I, I don't know if, if this settles on you like it settles on me. But you have to be really, really angry with God to be so mad that he has compassion on people. To be so angry at him that when he turns with mercy and saves somebody, it ticks you off. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty far gone, if you ask me. And that's exactly what happens. To Jonah, this seemed wrong that God had that much compassion. And he became angry and he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, you would do? I mean, wow. You're going to ask me to go all the way to that. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to relent. And you're going to have compassion on all these people. And I'm going to look like the idiot because that's just what you do. That's just what you do. I'm going to look like the bad guy in the kingdom because I'm the one with the voice that came and declared all these things. And you're just going to be God and come in and just save everybody. And I'm going to look like the fool. Me, 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 me. It's all about me with Jonah. He's gotten to the point where he's acting a lot like Lucifer. A lot like the devil. A lot like just before the fall from heaven to hell. Because it's exactly the same image that the enemy tries to, we, uh, to, to whirl around in us. God isn't. He's never gonna. Are you sure? Has he ever? When is he? I don't see your, your finances getting any better. I don't see your prodigal coming home. I don't see any of this healing happening. I mean, come on, is God ever gonna really do this? And we hold on to those things and we have no idea that God's that, that, that our hearts are in a, in a position where our offenses are located toward God. I, I, I heard a huge radio um, uh, promoter or, or podcaster who said that 99 of people's offenses um, aren't with the person that they feel like they're offended to. It's all headed toward God. God usually gets the bad rap for everything. And so here we are, and this whole thing comes down with Jonah. And... Um, uh, and Jonah says, I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down on the place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up all over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Mercy. And Jonah was very happy about the plant, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live again. He says this, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. Understand, God's first question to Jonah is, is it right for you to be angry that I have compassion on people? And Jonah goes, hmm, and he walks out to the east part of the city and he flumps himself down and he makes a little shade for him and he just wallows in it. And God says, let me ease his comfort. Let me show him something. And so God provides shade for him, which is the mercy of the Lord that provides the shade for us. And then when the shade looks like it's no longer the shade, all of a sudden what's actually in the heart begins to rise back up. Why don't you just kill me, God? You're never going to do what you said you're going to do. Why don't you just stop? Why don't you just walk away? You're never going to do this. You're not the God I thought you were. 
And the Lord asks the question again, is it right for you to be angry about the mercy? You have no right, son, to be angry about it. You have absolutely no right to be angry with me for what you've held on in your heart. It isn't my fault that you have decided not to lay down your stuff and then blame me for it all. I won't own that. I'll take it from you. I'll redeem you, but I'm not gonna own it. It's not mine to own. It's yours to let go of. And we don't hear much about Jonah. I, I, I want you to see though, um, for 120,000 people, it has this really beautiful ending to this. In verse 10, it says, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And it ends with this, and also many animals. I found that really interesting, that scripture ends with that. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but remember the king put even the animals on a fast. And it was the mercy of God to say, I will even remember that. Because God is a detailed God. And he doesn't want us to hold our anger. And I think there's so much of us that are in a place sometimes where we're not maybe half um, or remotely um, near the road to Joppa. But I'm telling you that the enemy's um, plan for our lives is to get us so um, uh, completely undone politically that we join in the Facebook conversations I mean, I, I can't even get on there anymore. I can't even hardly watch the news anymore because on both sides, I'm sick to my stomach. And so I spend a lot of time just saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Because what's happening is the heart of men isn't right to even have a, a conscious um, discussion where anything will ever be decided because our hearts have become so hard and our hearts have become so angry and not that we don't have right to feel the distress of it at all, but do we have the right to shame somebody or to pull somebody down? On both sides, we have no rights to do that. And so what's happening is we've become a people that don't even know where God is. And we find ourselves sometimes, even in our circumstance, pulling away from God. I, I um, have a sister, she's about 14 months older than me, and we were very close growing up. We spent years and years growing up in the same room, sharing the same room. And her um, a lifelong goal was just to get married and have children. She just wanted to be an episode of Little House on the Prairie when we were little. She wanted to be Ma Ingalls. She wanted to live on a farm, raise a bunch of chickens. And that's all she ever prayed to the Lord for. Had no aspirations to be anything else but a wife and a mom. And she met a man um, in the late 80s after she graduated high school. And he was a good guy. He um, hadn't been raised a Christian, had a really difficult mother and father very territorial, territorial mother, um, controlling father. Um, but he found the Lord and he found that God had a call on his life. He wanted to be an evangelist. And there were things in his life that I don't know that he ever truly laid down, but he was able to live in a place where he would get just enough healing that it would kind of coat over the things that he wasn't fully laying down. He was a big debater. He was the guy at all the holiday functions that started like um, the debates. And um, really just for the sake of riling people up, you know, um, he, he loved to just rile people up. It was part of his thing. He really should have been in politics because he had that kind of um, um, verbiage. He had that kind of, he could make you believe anything kind of thing. And he really was a good guy. They began to have children. He was an amazing father. Like he loved those kids. They homeschooled. He built a house for them on five acres. He worked for the union. It was a truck driver, so he was gone a lot. They homeschooled all those babies around a table. He um, was part of the... Um, uh, co-op homeschooling network and he would go and teach um, and coach for the, uh, for the homeschoolers and everybody really loved him. I mean, he was the kind of guy that didn't get to church often because he was always on the road and when he came in, he always uh, met with the pastor to talk through what the pastor had said from the pulpit because he, he half wanted to know and half wanted to debate about it. You know, he was a Bible scholar. He wanted to go to Bible school and be a theologian and somewhere between 
the 10th and the 18th year of their marriage, he just started to um, stop laying things down before the Lord that gave him enough um, to keep in a sense, pursuing the goodness of God. Things began to pile up and she didn't really say anything. My sister is a, um, she's Ma Ingalls. I mean, she's just, you just deal with it. You wear it on your back. She never had a bad word to say. She's very much like my mother. Couldn't be in a room with anybody gossiping about anybody else. Didn't have a grid for it. She was an incredible mother. And um, all of a sudden I started getting phone calls where she was just sobbing and crying and she started um, revealing things. And I was like, well, what's happened? And my brother-in-law was a anti, no smoking, no drinking, no cussing. He was almost on the side of religion with all of that stuff with his children. And she said he's bringing home alcohol all the time. And, and we just watched his life kind of ebb and flow away. And, and my brothers tried to meet with him and, and he tried to tell my brothers that it was all her fault. Well, we knew there was, no, I mean, there was nothing. Nobody in their right mind would ever accuse my sister of anything. She was so faithful. And she was the one there. She was the one in church. She was the one counseling with pastors. She was the one that was showing up. And his life became so much um, of a detour that he finally one day packed up everything that he had and he left the 18-year-old um, son holding the three-year-old son on the front porch, called their mother a harlot and drove away and filed for divorce and fought her for custody of the kids. They got joint custody of the kids, devastating my sister in ways I've never seen anybody devastated and then never ever saw the kids but one time in the next five years. Abandoned that family, abandoned those children, and we got letters in the mail, all of us siblings got letters in the mail, and the letters said, if you do not repent to me for what you've done to me, you will pay the consequence. And my letter ended up going to my brother who's an FBI agent, and he said, I will never show you that letter. So we didn't know what his plot, what, what his plan was, but about five years ago now on Mother's Day, um, he walked into the home of a stranger, um, a young woman with her seven-month-old baby and her mother-in-law in the house, and he tried to rob her. She was a look-alike for my sister, and we didn't know that his picture was on convenience stores in town because he was coming in and just robbing tobacco and alcohol but he didn't have a, a record, so nobody knew who he was. It was just his picture on the, on the uh, front of these um, cash register, by the cash registers of these convenience stores. And he walks in and he hits the woman and steals money from her bag and runs out and the police show up and they, they, there's DNA left at the, at the scene, but he's not in the system, so they don't know who he is. And at this point, all that we're hearing is that, you know, he's this emaciated, um, crazy lunatic living on his dead father's property. And nobody, not even his own family, is able to even come near him. At two o'clock in the morning, he returns to that house and breaks in when the husband's there. The husband is a CrossFit trainer, comes downstairs when he hears the dogs barking and my brother-in-law's, ex-brother-in-law at this point is standing in the hallway and they, um, they start to fight. And the uh, police report said that, that the, the guy um, didn't even know what he was fighting because he had never seen any, anybody with that kind of strength. This is a strong guy that, that was a CrossFit trainer and, uh, and could have taken my brother-in-law my ex-brother-in-law, but he couldn't do it. So he calls out for his wife. His wife comes downstairs and she grabs a butcher knife from the kitchen, stabs my ex-brother-in-law nine times and kills him on their living room floor. Jesus. It was a horrible, horrible season of my family's life because five children, when my 18-year-old nephew next time saw his father, he had to ID him on a cold slab. And I'm telling you, it started off where he was a very gifted, very talented, very amazing man of God. 
But when we discovered on his property that he left volumes of books with encounters with demons where he would describe the demons and what they told him to do, he had given his life over to a life. He had given all of his stuff over to sin in a way that sin consumed him, took over his mind. He had been involved with deep pornography and trafficking at truck stops. And it just literally took over his mind. And he left that to deal with, with his five kids, all of whom today are walking with the Lord, love the Lord, and have gone through an incredible season, but God has redeemed them. Sometimes we don't know what gets us to that point. I'm not saying that people here are at that point. I'm just saying that I don't think Jonah thought he was either. And I don't know where you are today. I don't know what God's done in your life. I don't know what God hasn't yet done in your life. But I'm, I'm, I'm putting that out there to say, there's two different things I just wanna call out this morning. I wanna call out those who find themselves disappointed in the season that they're in with God. And it's okay to be just disappointed. It doesn't mean that you're gonna end up on a boat to Tarshish. We talked with the women about, can you be blameless and still be disappointed? Yeah, if you're still in the house, if you're still walking it out with the Lord. Yes, there are things, but some of us are at places where we just know we're just grieved with God and we don't know how to get through it. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here in your Nineveh. Maybe you just need to be redeemed by God. Maybe this is the day that God's swooping down and he's proclaiming his love over you for the first time. He's proclaiming his righteousness over you for the first time. And your response is like the king of Nineveh. I just want the Lord. I just want the Lord. I'm gonna go to the piano. Marco's gonna come and close our service. I'm just gonna sing a song. You could join in with the song. But I, I feel like that, that those are the two things that are stirred in my heart this morning. I feel like God wants to call us home. He wants to call us back into communion with him, call our disappointment out. Again, maybe some of you are in a place where you just know, man, yeah, I've been angry with God and I never want to get to that point. I just don't want to get to that point. I don't want to get to that point where I question the goodness of God. Does that make sense? So Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would come. I ask that you would just move in this place that you would just move in this place, move in this, and um, have an encounter with us, Jesus, because I just want you to come and do what only you can do. So Holy Spirit, come. Yeah, we just worship you, God. We worship you this morning. And even if that's you and you want to find a place or come to the altar and just kneel before the Lord, I just believe that the salvation of the Lord is in this place today. And you go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of
picked up all my pieces, put me back together. You were the defender of my heart. And when I thought I lost me, you knew where I left me. You reintroduced me. What? 